Welcome everybody today. Uh, my name is Matt Schutze. I am your illustrious host for the next 40 minutes. Um, I'm going to do a little story about embedded Java development. Um, first off, anybody here use Java regularly? Excellent. Good, because there's a bunch of Java terms that might be unfamiliar to some of you that aren't Java developers or, or professionals. Hopefully those will become evident. Um, we're going to go through this pretty quickly paced. We will, hopefully we'll have some time at the end for questions. If not, you can definitely see me after the talk. Um, I'm here at the show uh, for the rest of the week. So with that, we'll get going. Um, what, is, uh, what is this all about? This is about embedded development, putting software on devices to do work for you, not necessarily on a computer, but on a machine that has a computer in it, typically. Um, and where we are on the landscape of Java 9 is a pretty exciting time. So I'll lay out the saga or the story um, and posit a, 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 what, we, what I feel and what I've observed in, working in Java as to be the current state of the world of embedded development. Um, I'm going to go into a little background about the difference between a host and a target. That's really important to understand when you're doing embedded work. I'm going to talk about fragmentation. This isn't memory fragmentation or disk fragmentation. It's more broader than that. It's fragmentation of, of the industry that is uh, embedded development. I'm going to talk about this, where we are on the path of Java convergence. Um, there's a couple of things that have converged in the last two to three years, and they're going to culminate in Java 9. And hopefully you'll see how that you know, it, uh, elongates the saga, makes it a little more compelling today versus even a short two, three years ago. Then I want to explain what we at Azul, Azul Systems is my company, um, I'm the director of product management there. We are very much a Java company. That's all we do is Java virtual machines. So um, we're, I want to explain what we're working on now in the open source community to bring embedded development into the modern age uh, for Java developers. And then dig in just a quick sneak peek at what is happening in Java 9. Uh, Java 9 is in development right now. It's gone through a bunch of big milestones, and it's coming very soon to a theater near you, meaning spring of next year. So we're, we're into the, the bulk of the, the new development and feature work is done. Now it's making it hardened and bulletproof for worldwide use. And then what to do with, uh, if you are going to ever be faced with an embedded project, what are your options and what does the future hold for you? Because it looks really bright from where we stand today. Um, so first, I'd like to welcome everybody, um, especially, like I said, all you Java folks. If you're new to Java, hopefully this isn't too deep. It's kind of a survey overview, a bunch of concepts, um, not, a, not a whole lot of code. But it's the ideas, hopefully, that you can pick up from this. But the premise is... The inventor of Java, James Gosling, was a was not I won't call him a, a soothsayer, but he definitely had a, a heroic vision for computing uh, back when he invented Java. Um, and there's a couple of things that have held true now that Java is even 20 years old and has been you know been the lifeblood of lots of different application types since the version 1.0 that he invented. And you know, occasionally some other superheroes like to ride his coattails. So if you ever saw Azul Man, you'd see that you know he gets around here too. Um, but the premise of what we're going to talk about today is the it's the write once, run anywhere. You know, I'll use that a couple times. Wara, uh, Gosling and the Java team at Sun Microsystems uh, were faced with embedded development. They were going to put Java inside of TV set-top boxes. And James was frustrated because he had to choose all of the different types of processors they could put into a machine and have to rewrite C code time and time again for a different chip architecture. So he went off with his group and came up with something that was uh, more portable for the application developer, and that is the Java Virtual Machine. The Java Virtual Machine lets you write your Java code one time, you, you compile it to bytecodes, and then you can target those bytecodes to the different processor architectures that have JVMs on them. And uh, why is that important? Well, today there are several vendors still building Java virtual machines, but not all of them are in embedded. And fragmentation, where you have to do things multiple times, different ways to get the same output, uh, is, is a tr productivity drain for, for software developers, for companies, for people uh, building consumer goods or industrial internet. Uh, fragmentation is a, is a, you know, it's a lot of energy to get to even 
par on different architectures. So, so why is Java interesting? Well, Java, after Java 8, um, a year and a half ago, has got renewed um, lifeblood in, across the whole I, IT landscape, and we think especially in embedded, where Java started at, the, at its roots. And once again, we're at this crossroads where trying to keep things from being fragmented to have different vendors doing different things on different architectures versus the you know, upholding the right once run anywhere principle, we're crossing swords. They go against each other. People are always competing for what's better as opposed to competing for a standard that we can all uphold, move forward, and all build on top of that. So um, it's interesting days, and I, I, the, the conclusion that you'll see is Java 9 takes us another step closer towards having portable, write once, run anywhere code down for the embedded space, which is slightly different than the, the server or desktop space. And that gets into, well, what is embedded development? What is the act of development? How is it different? Uh, I, I like to make this, uh, this, there's a comparison, and it took me a long time to really understand this. I think it was um, maybe even uh, early 1990s. When you're writing code for the host, for the machine you're on, that's a luxury. If you have to write code for a different machine, your target machine, your behavior is different. You have to figure out how to do useful work on the host and have it reflected in the target. So, so that's sort of some of the definitions. If, if you're new to embedded or if you haven't tried to do host target differential programming, I, I wanted to get into the definition and explain why this matters. Um, first off, I cribbed this definition or this explanation from the, from the Intel developer forum. Basically, your host system is where you have your tools and your source and you're working, but the target is where you're going to push the output. That's got to actually run your program. So um, you can have any mix of hosts and targets as long as the, the tools and the communication agree and you can then test your target application. Um, so for, for the purposes of here, the host is always the machine where your tools sit and your source and usually that's where you check your email and do all the other business things throughout your day but your target is the processor on which your code will execute. And um, it's a luxury if it's the same system. That if you're doing server application, desktop application, oftentimes you're on the machine that you're coding for. Embedded, you're never guaranteed you'll be on the machine you're coding for, at least not fully. And, and that's why the problem domain is, a, is different. You have to keep in mind what are you coding against. Um, in terms of the overall saga of embedded development, traditionally you were at the mercy of the, the chip vendor. The chip vendor said, you can use these tools on our chip, you can't use anybody else. Good luck if you try. Um, and then what stuff your target can do is your requirements. What other things do you have to put on either a JVM or a Bare OS to get, it, to get useful work? What peripherals? Are you talking LCD screens? Are you talking digital I.O.? Are you talking you know, some other API that talks to the hardware, the, the, actual, the ATM machine, the, the, um, the tractor? You know, what device is it you're controlling? And so you, you're kind of constrained on both sides. What, what can the chip give you? What do your peripherals give you? And the idea that they're all hanging off of your PC or your laptop is wrong. It's, that's, that's a luxury if that's your target. Usually in embedded development, it's not. So I'm going to give some examples of my personal experience. This is where I get to talk about me, so I like, to, I like this part of the talk. Um, these are things I actually did back even before Java was invented. So the examples are the hosts and the targets and the reason to write the code for the target. So my very first real development project, I'll call it, was in grad school. I built a, a chemical reactor. The, the control surface were good old 486. 60 hertz, megahertz, Dell PCs. And um, you know, I plugged them up to, the, to relay boards and motors, and we controlled a small pilot plant chemical reactor. The host was a laptop, but the target was also the laptop. And all I had to do was make sure I had the right peripherals plugged into PC cards in, that, in the machine. Kind of the first taste of what embedded development for machine control looked like. Second one gets a little fancier. Now I've actually got, um, uh, we're into the world of more like Windows NT, so you know I'm dating myself a bit, but the host is still my trusty desktop, 
but the target is now not desktops. It is PC 104, the early incantations, or incantations of embedded processor boards you put into uh, an otherwise static uh, backplane. And so in this case, we actually built the system for NASA. It was used to control the flight termination. If like an experimental craft went off path out of control, you could pop a parachute and recover the, the vehicle. And so the embedded part of this was we had to actually put these machines into the NASA communication shed, write software for it, and you could never even touch your, your desktop again. It was, not a, it was not a computer anymore. It was a fielded system. Debugging it, fixing it, deploying it, installing it, totally separate from my host machine. <coughs> Next one I did is um, we actually, I work for a radar company. Here, again, my trusty desktop is my host, but my targets were a whole bunch of embedded PCs. I had to actually write code and flash it onto these while the machines themselves were installed in a, a KC-135 Air Force plane. So you can see sort of the picture of what, how ruggedized that looks totally different from my nice office where I was actually writing the first versions. So, um, and, and this is a situation where we were tracking the inbound fragmentation, if you will, of a, of a fuselage falling back to Earth from space. So we, we had to practice the art of designing for a target that was very specific. It was gonna go up in a certain airplane at a certain time of day on a certain day of the year with a radar pointed at a specific angle to capture that data. Um, very stressful because you did not have time to do experimentation other than um, with surrogate targets. You couldn't, you couldn't take a rocket fuselage home and work on it and debug it. You had to do it uh, using other tricks. Last one I did is where now I'm getting into more chips than just the PC, or, or, and I've got to worry about things like DSPs and FPGAs and even basic stamps, and this was uh, a, a job we did for British Aerospace. We actually built a radar on a forklift, and I had to do the motion control of the radar beams. And so that now you're talking about several different types of targets, the embedded chips in the motor controllers, the host computer that the operator sees, the um, you know, sensors and inputs from the forklift itself so you knew where it was. So again, you know, it's a mix of different processor architectures to do one job, but the job is on the site in, in somewhere in suburban Manchester. It is, it is in the middle of nowhere, so it's not a very convenient place to write code. So when you think about your targets, what am I building, what am I, what am I making? Almost every chip you buy today, even you know, the, um, on the Raspberry Pi 2, that's a better processor than I had. I was using 4666. And, and you know, the, the CPUs you can get that are as big as your fingernail outpace them by a long shot but you still have the hard challenges in bed development. What if your target, like the last three of these for sure, they were not in a comfortable place. The target was off on a tarmac or it was up in a plane. What if it's not available? What if it's not portable? I couldn't take any of those home. I couldn't take them, like a lot of them back to the lab to debug, I had to do it in the field. Um, what if it changes? What if the hardware you based something on is suddenly no longer made by the vendor? Or you know, some set of peripherals is no longer available for the chip that you standardize on. What do you do? Um, what if the hardware doesn't even exist yet? They haven't built you the hardware. Um, it's it's you know, got on its, uh, on its own timetable. It's coming, but it's not ready. So how do you still, in spite of all this, get useful software into the target so that your application works? You're still expected to hit your ship dates. Um, you know, like for the for the. Uh, satellite fuselage, we had a date. The date was not changing. We had to get all that stuff done in time for the date. And so shipping code matters. Shipping code that works matters. Meeting your business deadlines matters. How do you do it? That's where fragmentation comes back to bite you. Um, fragmentation in the embedded world means there's lots of different chips from lots of different vendors all trying to sell you their best thing, but it's hard for you to decide which is the right thing that I can use long term. Almost, um, almost all embedded, like hard real-time embedded is still in C. D Java is not number one or even number two. It's actually a distant third. And so, so why is that? Well, there's a bunch of different vertical industries that build embedded systems, and they have uh, different needs. Some of the things are hard real-time. Some of them are soft real-time. Um, but they all have different uh, propensities or, you know, favorites because their, their vertical industries have their own business rules. 
But almost everything today, right now, 2016, is 32-bit. Yes, there are 64-bit chips available, and yes, there are the old micro, small microcontrollers that people still use in certain things, but almost everything right now, right now is still 32-bit. And the act of embedded is not you know, one grad student sitting in his lab, it's a team, and like, uh, like business application teams. Embedded is a team sport. Um, I lifted this from, a, um, from a, a, an industry watchdog in the embedded space. It's, they say the average team size is about 14 people, and the average project is a year. But the thing that people spend more cost, more labor, more time on is the software as opposed to the hardware. And no matter what you do, if it takes a year, by the time you, between when you start and when you finish, the chip vendors will have new versions of their, of their gear. So you're always, you're always trying to deploy the latest chips you can for the project you've started. You always also try to reuse code. You don't necessarily want to reinvent the wheel if you don't have to, because you put all that investment into that software build out. Why not try to reuse it in the next project? And the other reality for embedded work is a good chunk of the time spent is not writing the code or the logic, it's debugging. It's figuring out what went wrong so it can't go wrong in the real world. And so the top two concerns for these, you know, for, for general purpose embedded development is how do we get out our product on time and how do we reduce the bug, debugging burden? Those are the top, there's a whole list of concerns, but those are the top two. And if you can, you want the whole stack, top to bottom, to be open source so you can debug down to the very lowest level. So, so if there's fragmentation in the industry and there's lots of different choices and it's hard to make a choice, what, what recourse do you have? And the answer to that, I say, is standards. Um, Java, since its inception, has tried very hard not to fragment itself. It can't, it can't help the, the chip makers. The chip makers are always going to do what they're going to do. Um, the OS is trying to differentiate. You know, Windows is trying to be different from Linux. The Linux distros are trying to be different from each other. Um, but the JVM and the Java language, they're trying very hard to make sure it's a standard. So no matter which JVM you pick, your code will run on it. And so the write only, uh, write once, uh, run anywhere is what gives teams that you know, 14 person embedded team the productivity boost to hit their one year milestones. But it only works if in this multi-vendor system where Azul is one of, our, one of the JVM vendors and Oracle and IBM and Red Hat and others that have JVMs are also in this space, how do we make sure that the standards are upheld? That's where it comes back to the organization that governs what's in Java, the Java community process. Java community process releases Java, um, Java feature requests or JSRs, Java standard requests, where the, the evolution of features and parts of the Java standard happen on a rigorous boundary. They have reference implementations and they have technology um, compatibility kits. So you can actually validate and verify that a JVM will support the standard. And that way you can have multiple Im implementations. You can have multiple vendors creating things that are compatible to let you Write once, run anywhere, as long as it's still Java. Getting down into the smaller chips, getting into micro edition is tougher because now you're, you're trying to throw away APIs to get the JVM as small as possible. So they allow profiles. It's still the same core APIs. You just have fewer of them. But they don't change the way they behave. Um, and then the programming model, the act of actually developing using the Java language is the same. It should feel the same. It should be the same whether you are writing for a desktop or a server or an embedded platform if it's based in Java. And here I give special anti-praise to Dalvik, which is the Android JVM. It is based on Java. It is not pure Java. It's a subset and a side you know, intersection of APIs. So um, we'll get back to Dalvik again to give it anti-anti-praise, but for now, Dalvik is not Java because they fragmented. They, they, forked, J, they forked Java, and now or, or Google and Oracle are battling that in the courts. Anyway, the convergence. What does Java convergence mean? Convergence means we are at a point where several trends have collided to benefit, in this case, um, the active Java development for embedded. The first thing, the Java community process, the standards body has collapsed micro edition into standard edition. There's one body. There's one body that governs the standards. And there's equal representation from the 
small device uh, micro edition vendors as the standard edition and enterprise level um, groups. The, the act of building compact profiles has now standardized. That came out in Java 8. You actually have three standard sizes of a compact profile, one, two, three, tiny, not so tiny, and almost full JVM or full JRE, just no graphics. So you have your choice now of standardized profiles that are still the full standard edition. It's the same code, it's the same APIs. Um, and it, reflect, it effectively replaces one of the Java micro edition formats, which was called the CDC. That, the, there's no need for that anymore because the standard edition takes its place. There still is a need for the very small, um, the CLDC profile, which is um, where now you take the JVM and a limited set of APIs and you add back on the special things for micro edition. Um, and again, you're doing that because one is for auto, and one might be for telco, and one might be for, um, for arrow. So there's different reasons to have different APIs on top of those profiles. But the other thing is the little itty bitty chips that run for under 100 bucks on a full board are great. They're dual core, they're giga RAM, you know, multi gigahertz clocks. They smoke the 486s I was using. So the, the, the compute power is fantastic, even in a little tiny package good enough to run a full JVM, Java uh, Standard Edition. The other thing is for tooling. Tooling in, in embedded is typically hard. Remember I said you were a slave to your, Java, or to your, to your embedded chip uh, platform vendor. Not so much anymore if you're running in Java. You have simulators. You have simulators that let you run on the host. You're writing in Java. You can actually practice a lot of code on the host before you push to target. And the other nice thing about the JVM is remote debugging is part of it. It's been part of the JVM forever. So the concept of having you know, just a network layer between your host and target is great. You can debug as if you're you know, from the host easily to the target. Mock testing setups, which have been um, really handy in enterprise development where you can mock away a certain API or a certain data, database or data provider so you can get the application logic above it worked out is perfect for embedded because you can actually say, I'm gonna simulate this thing to be the, the device Maybe, maybe mock up some fake data stream that it provides me and write all the logic for the application above it. And the same goes with dependency injection. If you can swap in different providers using uh, 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 different interfaces, you, you, bring, you can late bind what your application does with the hardware when it becomes available. And so, I mean, the premise of that is with, with the tooling convergence that you can leverage in the wonderfully rich Java ecos um, ecosphere, you get pretty far being able to write it, to write it once. Um, you still have to run it on your target, but you can get a lot of logic worked out before you have to, before you have to uh, flash it. Um, and then in terms of processors, the tiny chips are not tiny. They are fantastic compared to, again, what, you know, what I started off using. Um, you know, dual core 500 megahertz, that's a, that's a pretty svelte package. Uh, it gives you a ton of room to actually put a full OS, your JVM, your code, your data. And um, remember I said this is a 32-bit world still. You can, you can always bump to 64 if you really have the data needs, but for embedded, you, you almost don't ever need that much, <coughs> that much flat addressable data in one tiny package. A gigabyte of RAM is plenty for a lot of this. Um, and there has been consolid some consolidation. ARM obviously is in a lot of your, your phones and tablets, but Intel is playing the, the, the embedded game too. They've got smaller end chips. And Power and MIPS are kind of the, the only two that are on the outside. But a, a lot of companies have standardized on ARM. And the targets are so good, they behave like little hosts. You log into an RPI, it's like you're at your own Linux you know, head. You can actually run it as if you're local. So the ease of which deploying targets when they are little hosts make them, again, you know, the premise is that makes embedded development easier. When it comes to the, the diversity and the, the fragmentation of APIs, here's a, um, this is, I borrowed this from somebody, where this is an actual overlay of the APIs that go into the CLDC, the compact, um, uh, Small little device, some, I can't remember what it stands for, but anyway, it's, it's the, the foundational API that um, the micro edition was based on, and the expansion for the, the, the um, Java 8 release, the directions that Android has taken it, the, um, 
the directions to add OpenGL, and then um, the uh, G GCF8. So the, the, the point of this slide was that there is a common denominator, and that common denominator is, has grown. It's not, there's not complete overlap. We still have fragmentation. Not all APIs are the same, but the act of developing against these APIs is the same. The behavior's the same. The JVM's the same. And um, some, some data I picked up about the CLDC 8 spec, it's got all the same base APIs as Java Standard Edition. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of it's based on I.O. and security. And even if you cut it down to the compact API, it's, this, it's still the same set. So you get a lot of Java in a very small package. Um, and again, it's a standard. This is what you get if you, if you pull down that particular uh, profile. The last piece of convergence I want to say is um, where, again, I, I give back some praise to Dalvik, and that's the other area that is very much like this, where you're, you have a host that you're writing code on and a target you're flashing to is mobile. Because if you're going to write apps for your phone, you're doing the same thing. You might start on your desktop, but you end on another device. I don't know of anybody that can actually write code on the device on a phone. But, so it's the same developer experience. What does that mean? It means as mobile expands, then people are comfortable with this host target programming environment, and you get the benefits of any tooling or uh, experience writing that way. And this is where I give back uh, the praise to Dalvik, because people have found writing apps for uh, Android to be lucrative, powerful, relatively easy, and still the DNA is Java. So it's the, the learning experience and the, the, the barrier to entry is the same. It's small. So why does Azul care? Why do I care? Why am I here talking about all this embedded stuff? Um, first off, uh, we're here at the show. We, we've got a booth set up. Um, we, we're mostly here talking about our open source JVM, which is our Zulu product. Zulu is a binary distribution of the OpenJDK open source project. OpenJDK has got a bunch of companies and, and individuals that are contributing. Uh, the main steward is Oracle, but we've got Azul, we've got Red Hat, we've got IBM, Intel, Hewlett Packard. There's a bunch of people that contribute to OpenJDK. But Zulu is our, we, we pull OpenJDK source, we build it, we test it, we certify it, we ship it, we put it on our website for a free download. We also integrate it with a whole bunch of different other things like AWS and, and Azure and Juju and Docker. So Zulu, if you haven't heard of Zulu, you should look, because it's, it is, it is a, uh, we're trying to make it a standard available binary distribution of OpenJDK, Java Standard Edition. Um, and we first announced this back at Java 1. Uh, we, we started off on Windows. Uh, it turns out OpenJDK 6 for Windows was awful. We had to fix a bunch of broken code to even make that possible. Uh, but we immediately expanded it to, to all the common desktop platforms and then took it into embedded space starting January last year. Um, there we take the same OpenJDK, but we carve it down into the runtime package or the compact profile packages. And we started off on 64-bit um, uh, 64-bit Intel, but, but that's just because where we started. We wound up quickly going down to the 32-bit Intel, and then now uh, that's running in the field on a bunch of different processors. It's actually embedded by companies that, are, that have put Zulu onto their uh, commercial gear. And now, I'm, I can't announce this because we've already announced it, but we, I'm here to share that uh, we've now got an ARM 32-bit JVM as well. Java Standard Edition for ARM 32. Uh, it's, the, it's the ARM v7 family. And we're in beta. We don't have it available fully publicly, but we are working with uh, various partners and customers, and they've already gotten the early access bits. We've had fee uh, two rounds of feedback. The latest one was in April. And when it comes to support, Azul is in the business of supporting use of open source. So uh, any form of Zulu, whether it's the enterprise or the embedded, you get the same support as from our professional offering, which is the Azul Zing JVM, the um, server-side JVM. Same people, same JVM engineers. One call gets you to an actual JVM expert. But the community is the other aspect of Zulu that I want to talk about a little bit because that's something I, I work very hard to try to support. The community of Zulu uh, transcends the embedded and the enterprise and everything else. And it's, I like to say we're focused on Zulu in the four Fs. It's free. You can go get Zulu today, download it from Zulu.org. Um, so there's no cost. There's freedom. The, the OpenJDK distribution, Azul is correctly following the rules 
of the open source license that governs OpenJDK, and we do not put back onto our binaries the restrictions that other JVM vendors do. So there are a lot fewer uh, field of use restrictions. You want to use it on virtual, great. You want to put it in the cloud, great. You want to put it on embedded, great. They're all open. Um, and it's fast. We're trying to stay in lockstep with the OpenJDK project. We already have our OpenJDK 9 builds up, even though it's not going to be done until March. So um, we're trying to make sure that people can touch 9 now while it's forming and finishing and, and at, you can actually start to play with some of the new features and functions as opposed to waiting. Um, and then fun, we are trying to make sure that people understand Zulu, Zulu is Java, Java is Zulu, is OpenJDK, it's all the same. And we, have, we do have a, a growing community of people that are using it in their work and in their play. So it's, we're trying to make sure that the Zulu side is fun. Um, and this is the kind of fun we have. We put Java into little robots. We, do, we drag this thing, out, this little demo, which is actually a Microsoft demo for IoT. It's a robotic car controlled with a joystick, um, and we had that driving around the table, Java 1. That's the kind of stuff we're trying to do, put Java into machines that normally wouldn't have it. Uh, this is just a, you know, it's a trade show demo, but it's the idea that you can actually code to a target um, that fits different shapes. In terms of, you know, so what are we doing? Why do we care? What, what are we actually doing as a company? Um, we're trying to put back onto Java Standard Edition some of those APIs that you would get in the Micro Edition. So things for I.O., things for serial, serial peripherals, um, things for the sensors that you'd want attached uh, to any, you know, as peripherals to any device. And we demonstrated those last year at Java 1. We demonstrated them again with the Eclipse group. We've also since released a Zulu for, I, for Windows 10, IoT Core. So we're actually working with Microsoft as a partner. And the, like I said, our ARM32 builds are in beta. Um, and to do that work, we teamed with Linaro. So it's, we're not doing it in a vacuum. We're trying to make sure that we wind up with an open source ARM32 JVM. Um, and that's also, you know, Linaro wants the same thing. And we, we, we know about the ARM64, but we haven't released those. Those are in-house only still. So we're active. We're, we're actively trying to build JVMs um, across many different dimensions. And what does it mean when you go to nine? Why does nine matter? Who cares about nine? Nine is, like I said, it's still a couple of months away, but nine changes the internals of the JVM in a fundamental way. Normally, when, you, when we did the compact profiles, yeah, we threw away some APIs, but you wound up with a bunch of things in the JVM that were then sort of uh, not used or, or not, um, uh, not going to be part of the end application. So what did Oracle and the other JCP folks decide to do? They're going to refactor the JVM into a modular format. What we've all, I think you've heard of modules in terms of OSGI where you can actually provide bundles of things that are, that are dynamically loadable and unloadable. But the point of the Jigsaw project in Java is to say, let's figure out the lowest possible common denominator of dependence of dependent objects, dependent um, pieces, and build the JVM so that the de dependency map is actually formalized, so that others can extend it, and it's also modular, meaning you don't need to ship everything at once. You can actually cut it into logical pieces. So this is this is the after. You can see that it's a downward directed graph of dependencies from the higher level to the lower level. You can sort of make out that there's a base component that is the sort of the atomic core of, of Java 9. And there in the middle, you can see that there is still a compact one, compact two, compact three. But what that really means is now the JVM can scale down to an even smaller package. Um, we still have the same footprint, the one, two, three, but they are ultimately smaller pieces using smaller module um, bo boxes of code, which is what we want in embedded. We want to have small packages that fit on you know, small to medium-sized chips that don't ship more junk, more fluff, more extra pieces that are not part of the app. And so, um, so what's the purpose of the Jigsaw? A modularization mechanism. Uh, it is in flight. It is not done, but it's getting close. It's, it's actually, uh, there was a, a, a big push in March to push the Jigsaw project into OpenJDK 9, into the main branch. So as of um, our March Zulu 9 build, 
jigsaws in there. There's still fixes, there's still work, it's not done done, um, but the final output is, uh, you know, it's a reliable configuration that can be built and, and tailored to, uh, to a, a footprint or a form factor. It's trying to remove the, the class path hell where you actually, you know, have things on your compile path as well as your runtime path and how do you make sure that they work. Uh, it also, Im we're trying to improve security by saying, if code is not part of this application, cut it away. So it's not, it's not there to exist as an attack surface. Um, it also helps it for embedded because you can put exactly what you need into the app and no more. Again, for, with respect to footprint, keeping footprint down on your target. And so lastly, I just want to you know, say we are at, we're at the point, the turning point. Java 9 is close, a couple months away. Um, but in terms of what does the future hold for it, well, we're kind of at the point in IoT where it's turning out to be a real market with real dollars and real buyers. And, and yeah, it's, got a, it's pretty high on the hype cycle, but it's the, the analysis is there will be spend in this area and there will be big spend. Um, you see the consumer goods, you see the wearables, you see um, the things that you, know, you could buy that are connected, but that's only about a fifth of the actual uptake in it embedded. The other four fifths is industrial side. And even in that, only 20% of that spend is on software. So there's room to play in this, in this area as long as we fight the fragmentation, as long as we can actually agree that you know, th there are, there's a Java API, It'll work on as many chips that have JVMs, which is why we're building out JVMs. Uh, and, and Java can you know, rise up from third to maybe knock off the second or first in the embedded language space. And we know today people are taking Zulu and using it in projects. The question will be, can you put it not just on the gateways, which are sort of like the routers that you use to connect to the devices, but the devices themselves. And that's very exciting when we talk about compact profiles and even smaller footprints. Um, and then uh, lastly, if you think about what an IoT app is, it's not just the device, it's the device, it's the gateway, it's the communications, and it's backend usually with a cloud application tier, maybe even a cloud data tier. And that's where we like to say, if you're gonna do that, then uh, Azul Zing is your JVM of choice there. Uh, a lot of these, uh, point of presence uh, devices can actually generate tons of data. So where are you gonna put it? Well, um, gotta put it somewhere. And the, the other aspect that is a trend right now where you can actually touch and feel and build things is, this, is the maker culture where it, you, know, you can get down to a market of one. You build something for yourself. And um, you learn. You you actually can you know go to a hacker night, and put put a bunch of chips on the table, and before the, the night's done, you've hacked something together that actually works. So to me, that's the interesting part of this, the fun side. You can actually make things yourself out of uh, in, with an affordable set of prototyping tools using a comfortable language like Java. And um, you know th this my own personal. So I gave you stories of what I tried to do back uh, in the in the mid '90s. My goal in Embedded in the next year, I hope, if I find a free time, is I love music. I love that um, we're here in Austin. I, I love that my kids all took piano lessons and they all were playing really good stuff in the house. It felt great to hear the piano like ringing through the house and they've all quit. It really bums me out. So I have a piano, but I have no player. I want to make my own piano player using embedded processors. I've already prototyped this in my basement. I've got little fake mechanical fingers. I just need to get enough of them to cover the whole keyboard and then drive music from uh, uh, an embedded processor. That's the other fun thing to try to figure out. Can you put code logic that mimics human fingers playing the different notes? It's a big exercise in encoding and control um, and that, so, you know, that's, that's my, my retirement is all set with projects, including this one. Um, hopefully I don't wait that long. But anyway, that's the kind of stuff you can do if you think through, if, if I can put it on an embedded board with some peripherals, I can hack this up for a couple hundred bucks. That's experimentation. That's, uh, could be a lot of fun. And so, um, that, that's kind of brings me to wrap up. What's the, what's the conclusion here? Um, conclusion is we feel Java is we're going right back to where it started with James Gosling's vision for 
ending the fragmentation by having common JVM APIs available on any processor where there's a JVM. And so we want the Java vendors to standardize. We want to stay together and make sure that the JCP works, that the standards are solid, and that all vendors can, can play on the same playing field. Um, we're happy about the convergence in, in ME and SE. We're happy about the convergence in processors. We're very active in this area, um, so we encourage you to take a look. And I think it's going to be fun. It's a lot of fun to hook up electronics and have it actually do something useful. Um, think about what you want to do in your own projects, maybe come up with something like a player piano. Um, so that's it. If you want to follow what we're doing, uh, Zulu.org is the community site. And uh, we're, you, know, you can also look at our professional offerings on, on the Zulu website. Windows IoT Core is a project that's going on. That some of these trends in Embedded I talked about, that's the source for those. And if you like music, like I do, you're going to come by our booth today because we are raffling off a uh, Fender Stratocaster. So um, if, you, if you're interested, just go drop your, uh, your name on a card in the bowl, and you can uh, try to win it this afternoon at, at 345. That's it. Thanks very much.